Can the Knicks actually get the number one overall pick in this upcoming NBA draft? Before I continue, if you're watching on a desktop computer um, or you have access you know, on a mobile device, pull up the website tankathon.com. I'll wait. Tankathon.com. That's T-A-N-K-A-T-H-O-N.com. Bookmark it. You're going to be checking it almost every day for the remaining part of the NBA regular season schedule. So this website basically shows you where uh, teams that are, I guess, in tank mode, uh, where they rank, where they're slotted in the lottery. And then it also has this cool feature where you can run simulated lotteries. So right now, the Knicks are slotted at number nine. And it's funny because they have like the standings, but I guess reverse standings. So it shows you games back. And right now the Knicks are five and a half games back of Phoenix and Atlanta, who both have the worst record in the NBA. Oh, by the way, the Knicks won last night. And a a nice win at that. Coming out of the All-Star break, you looked at the remaining 23 games left for the Knicks in the regular season, and pretty much their season. and And you thought to yourself, what is the objective? And the objective, once you figure, all right, Obviously, with KP going down, the team not anywhere close to playoff contention. The idea is pretty much simple now. You're tanking. Whether the team is ever going to admit it or not, they're tanking. When you're tanking and you have a young crop of players, a young crop of players that you're still trying to find out who they are, what they have to offer, if they're a part of your future core, you put them out on the floor and you see what happens. And if that's going to cost you games, it's going to cost you games. Obviously, every loss right now gets the Knicks closer and closer to a better, better uh, lottery positioning. And you look at this upcoming draft, and the reason as a Knicks fan, you have to be excited because if there was ever a year for the Knicks to, to I guess, have uh, a colossal injury to their cornerstone franchise, it would be this year. Because this year's draft class is deep, is very, very deep. You have, you have potential, and, and again, it's, it's, it's tough to just call somebody a, corner, a franchise cornerstone or a potential franchise player, but you have players that fit the mold of franchise players up and down the lottery. So if you're the Knicks and you say to yourself, all right, you know, obviously, if Jared Jack last night was playing uh, any form of real minutes, I think you would have had a riot. Even though the game was in Orlando last night, I think you would have had a riot um, outside of Madison Square Garden. But you got to see the young guards play yesterday, which was good. Uh, Jared Jack, by the way, did not play last night, which I think a lot of Knicks fans are like, oh, thank God. You know, Jared Jack did his job for the Knicks. When he came in, he gave the Knicks a steady veteran presence. You think back to the beginning of the season, uh, the Knicks start 0-3. Roman Sessions is starting at point guard, you know, as the Knicks are trying to buy time, you know, um, you know, for Frank Nilakina. Roman Sessions gave you absolutely nothing. Both Sessions and Jack were brought in to be veteran presence. Um, Jack turned out to be more than just that. Jack actually gave you, you know, sort of that spark plug that this team needed that veteran point guard presence that the team needed, uh, and really showed a solid, steady veteran presence among some of the younger players. He was a positive for the Knicks. But when you get to a point in the season, uh, and as a franchise, where you know you're not going anywhere that season, your objectives are not to win in that season, um, when your franchise player in Kristaps Porzingis goes down for the season, you clearly your objectives change. So I, I think the frustration that you saw from Knicks fans in regard to Jarrett Jack was not so much directed at Jarrett Jack, but was more directed at Jeff Hornacek for continuing to play Jarrett Jack the heavy minutes, the fourth quarter minutes when you know the the real objective for the remainder of the season is to see what you have in Frank Nilakina and what you have now in Emmanuel Moutier, who's going to be extension eligible this offseason, 
He is signed to this this contract, this current contract, his rookie deal, through the end of next year. So there is somewhat of an emphasis to see what you have in, in Moutier. But you also want to see what you have in Trey Burke. And that's what we saw last night. Trey Burke was the star of the show. 26 points, leading the way. A game-high 26 points. Six assists in 30 minutes. Uh, shot 12 of 22, which, I mean, again, we're not talking about some high-efficiency shooter here. But again, 12 from, 12, 22 from the field. Uh, two of five from downtown. Four rebounds. But... You know, Trey Burke showed you that he, you know, again, once upon a time, 2013, National Player of the Year at the University of Michigan when he was backcourt mates with Tim Hardaway Jr., he has scoring ability. He has the ability to penetrate and to pass. Yes, he's a bit on the smaller size, uh, can give you hints of defense, but uh, again, he's not going to be mistaken for, Chris, you know, Chris Paul defensively, but he showed you something last night. You know, when you think about the kind of games that you'd be okay with the Knicks winning, now granted, when you beat a team like Orlando, who right now, again, if you're looking at tankathon.com, they're in that third lottery positioning. They have the second, they're tied uh, with Dallas and Sacramento for the second worst record in the NBA. So in a way, it's, it's kind of a weird conundrum that the Knicks are in, that when you beat a team like Orlando... In a way, it's a bad thing because you're further strengthening the the draft lottery chances of a team like Orlando that's kind of ahead of the um, standings in that regard. But it's a good win because you got major contributions from a Trey Burke. And then if you see that, you know, if you're watching and you saw that block by Frank Nilakina in the fourth quarter, Nilakina finished with seven points, uh, three rebounds, two assists in 30 minutes. But... What impressed you most is that is that defensive, you know, sequence where you know the Knicks um, turned the ball over on the offensive end, and it was uh, Mario Hazania driving to the hoop, and out of nowhere you see Nilakina extend that long arm of his to get the block, and you know um, Trey Burke had a block in the fourth quarter as well. So you were seeing tight defense from the younger Knicks unit on the floor. You know, at one point you had Nilakina, Moutier, um, and Burke on the floor at the same time, which, again, as a Knicks fan, you're watching that, you're saying to yourself, good, you know, this is what we want to see. This is what, you know, the Knicks are, they need to see in order to evaluate what it is that they have in these younger players. But, you know, you look at this final score, and you consider that the Knicks allowed 41 points in the first quarter of that game. 41 points. And the rest of the way, they only allowed, uh, if if my math is correct here, 72 points. So 41 points in the first quarter, 72 the rest of the way. So clearly something clicked in the defensive end. Now, again, let's not get carried away. A win is a win. It's the kind of win where you say to yourself, ugh, yeah. You know, this is what scares me about this Knicks team, that they do have the ability to win games. But again, it's a win that featured some of the younger players. You're getting, you know, contributions from your, you're getting playing time for, from your, for your younger players. It's the kind of win where you say to yourself, I'll take it. And again, citing the record going into the All-Star break, I think off the top of my head, Without Kristaps Porzingis, the record was something like one and twelve or one and thirteen. Without Porzingis in the lineup, so let's not think that this team is going to win a lot more games. They're not. Obviously, Orlando is just not a very good team. Uh, you have some young, unsettled pieces there, and you have some older veterans that you know, aren't going to be there for very long. Um, that that team is not. You know, that team is firmly entrenched in getting a top pick. But you, know, you look at the Knicks and you say to yourself, you know, who do they stand to get in this upcoming draft? Now, the names that that fans are clamoring for and, you know, just hoping some way, somehow the Knicks can luck into them. Luka Doncic is, is, is obviously, you know, the guy that you, you look at and you say to yourself, like, man, if there's any way that the Knicks can somehow, some way, somehow, you know, lose enough games and just get, a lucky bounce of the lottery balls, 
Luka Doncic, for those of you not aware, he's six foot eight. He's a point guard. He plays for Real Madrid. He's 18 years old, and he's dominating in the Spanish Premier League. Spanish League is, I mean, you could argue, you could argue that beyond, behind the NBA, the Spanish League is the top league in the world, and he is absolutely dominating there. So this is not like a situation where, you know, you have a you know, second round talent who is playing in the Spanish league, 18, 19 years old and, and holding their own against older players against, you know, some of the top non NBA competition of the world. No, he's dominating them. So look at Donk, just one that, you know, Knicks fans say to themselves, oh my goodness, you can get a, a hand on a talent like that. Um, and you could set that up with a Christos Porzingis. That's your backcourt front court pairing of the future. Uh, Deandre Ayton, he's a center. Uh, out of University of Arizona. Uh, Mo Bamba is another interesting one. He's a center. He's seven feet. There are a lot of big boys, you know, at the early part of this draft, which is interesting because when you talk about the modern day NBA, you talk about it's a younger game. It's a faster game. It's more of an up and down tempo kind of a game. It's more of a three point shooting game. So when you look at, you know, players like Mo Bamba, uh, DeAndre Ayton, uh, Jaron Jackson, who's 6'11 out of Michigan State, you know, who were f- picked by many to be in the top five. Uh, Marvin Bagley out of Duke, exciting 6'11 center. So you have a lot of big boys picked to go early. Then Michael Porter. Michael Porter is the guy that, you know, if you think back to before the college season began, Michael Porter is 6'10, uh, plays for Missouri. He, he suffered that injury. Uh, at the beginning, I think it was either at the beginning of the season or in the preseason, but you know, pretty much forcing him to miss uh, most, if not all, of the remaining of the college season. So obviously, they're going to be that red flag. But you know, coming into college, coming out of high school, Michael Porter is seen as that you know prototype Kevin Durant type player. So given his injury, if you look at the mock drafts, a lot of them have him slotted at the five, six, seven ish range. So then you move yourself a little down. Outside of the big boys, the one name that you either love him or hate him, you either want him badly or you say to yourself, stay far away from him, is Trey Young. Trey Young out of Oklahoma. Some have made the comparison of of Steph Curry. Um, It's tough to say, but when you're a player like a Trey Young, college teams are going to double you. They're going to triple you. So anything he was able to get before... Um, you know, team started doing that. It, it, it's impressive in its own right, but anything he's going to do now positively, you really have to say to yourself, like if he's able to score with those kind of defensive alignments, um, you know, geared towards him, then you have to like what you see. Now, again, what are the knocks on him? Ah, he's a bit small. You know, he doesn't have quite that explosive touch or explosive step, rather. What do people say about Steph Curry coming out of Davidson? Eh, a bit on the small side, a bit frail. You know, he's going to have trouble against some of the big boys, some of the bigger guards in the NBA, and I, I think he turned out fine. Now, that's not to say that the same is going to translate for Trey Young. I mean, you, you see Steph Curry, he's a hard worker. I mean, you see him, you know, putting in work in those practice videos. You see him in, like, the warm-up lines, with, you know, dribbling two balls, doing all sorts of crazy things. This is a worker. This is not somebody who just you know, pretty boyed him way, his way into the NBA and he's just taking threes. This, this is a worker. And, you know, you see him, he's gotten physically bigger. He's he's evolved his game. So, but again, Trey Young draws a lot of Steph Curry comparisons. So I'm going to move it down now. The Knicks right now are picked to in that nine lottery spot. Again, if they get the luck of the lottery balls, who knows? But Colin Sexton is one of the names that uh, a lot of the mock drafts have the Knicks taken. Colin Sexton is, in a sense, the the game sort of reminds you of an Emmanuel Moutier or what you thought you were going to get out of Emmanuel Moutier. Obviously, still very early to tell. In that he's a he's a ball dominant guard, likes to penetrate. Um, he's six foot two, but he's got that explosive step, and he's got that willingness to take it in the paint every time. And that's the one thing that you know you wonder if Frank Nilakina ever will have, and that is that you know, that willingness to take it to the hole. He has the ability. He might not have the sheer athleticism or that sheer, you know, explosive first step, but he does have the ability to penetrate. And we've seen that in flashes. 
And then there are times where we'll see him drive and it looks like he's never driven a basketball before. But Colin Sexton is a name to keep uh, an eye on because he sort of is that complement to Frank Nilakina. But keep in mind, a lot of these mock draft projections um, came about before the Knicks traded for Emmanuel Moutier. The other name that the Knicks have been linked to in a lot of these mock drafts, um, Mikal Bridges. Mikal Bridges is, uh, he plays for uh, Villanova. This is your prototypical modern NBA small forward. And if you think about what the Knicks' sorest need is, if you if you assume full health, right? And let's just let's just imagine that Emmanuel Moutier turns into your your pure point guard. He's your one going into next season, um, and then he could alternate between their three guard set or um, you know have Hardaway as part of a three forward set. But you're gonna have Cantor as your center. That right now seems to be the case, assuming that he comes back. He does have a player option. But assuming the Knicks keep Ennis Cantor, he's going to be your center starting next year. Um, what you don't have is you don't have a small forward. And in this league, you need an athletic wing player. That's exactly what Mikal Bridges is. He's a defensive-minded six foot seven small forward, and he could stick it from downtown. You know, we often hear that term 3 and D. This is your pure 3 and D. I actually saw him in person um, a few weeks ago. Villanova played... Hofstra at Nassau Coliseum and you know this this is a player that can knock it down with ease from downtown he's got good size he's 6'7 but you know again he's just he's a lockdown defensive player so he would fill an immediate need for the Knicks but again the Knicks are are saying the right things Jeff Hornacek is saying that look we need to get the younger guys more playing time more experience um it seems clear that the Knicks are willing to to let these players go out there, be it Damian Dotson, be it Luke Cornett, Isaiah Hicks, the aforementioned Moutier, Nilakina, and Burke. Just go out there. Play your game. You make mistakes, you make mistakes. But the Knicks need to evaluate these players and see what they have in them and whether or not they fit the vision of the core going forward. Beyond that, when you're going to play that lineup, you're going to lose a lot of games. And while the Knicks right now are in that nine position, that could change in a hurry, and it could give the Knicks a whole lot more options heading into this upcoming draft, which is exciting because, again, you know, before the, the before the KP injury, I've been in the mindset, many others as well, that this team still needs pieces. Maybe not one more piece, pieces, if they really want to be serious players going forward. Obviously, there's always the quick fix, right? Make the trade for Kemba Walker or make the trade for somebody else, mortgage a pick. But we've seen that in the past, and it's never ended well. The Knicks finally seem to have the right idea as far as building this team going forward. And look, if, if KP's injury is eventually going to lead you into getting a prime draft pick, a prime lottery draft pick, maybe a second lottery draft pick next year, depending on how things play out, then you, know, you could very well argue that the team will have the makings off that young, solid core, assuming they hit on these draft picks. And then you're just going to hope that KP comes back healthy, that Nilakina continues to develop and will de- develop into what we think he could be, at the very least, a very good defensive guard. And then you're going to see what you have or what the Knicks decide, you know, when it comes to an Emmanuel Moody and some of these other young players. But again, it's going to be interesting to see how the Knicks approach the last 22 games, how things play out. You know, if they're going to go up against another one of these teams that are in that similar tanking category and how they play against them. And it's also going to be interesting to see what the Knicks end up doing with Jeff Hornacek because he is in such a quandary right now. He wants to play a certain style. Obviously, he wants to win games, but that might not be in the best interest of the Knicks. This is Nick FM. Our website is going to be launching very shortly. This is Nick FM. Our website's going to be live very soon at nickfm.com. We're going to be opening things up for contributors, be it uh, written articles, audio pieces, video features, so on and so forth. We're also going to have a forum. It's going to be a nice interactive platform for Knicks fans to come and talk Knicks.